Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. He is so worthy to be praised, glorified, honored, and lifted up by us this morning. Would you just praise him this morning? Give him all the shouts of glory and praise and honor. He is alive. He is alive in our lives. He has done an incredible thing in our lives. If we are truthful, from the day we met him to this very day, he has changed us. He's improved us. He is doing an incredible work, and it is not done yet. He is still working in our lives. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, our God is so good. Would you turn with me? To the Gospel of Mark. If you would go to Mark chapter 3. Mark 3. If you would, uh, we'll begin with verse 1. You can follow along with the verses that are here or use uh, the version or the Bible that you brought with you. By the way, I encourage people bringing the Bible. You know, that's one of the things. We put verses up here, and all of a sudden, we've heard, yeah, I see people raising Bibles. All right, that's good. Don't get lazy. Don't get lazy. You know, just because we put the verses up, make sure you were able to see it, whether it's on your phone, whatever. The only time we allow phones to be used, right, in that service. <laughs> all right, Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Another time, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we thank you so much for your word, because your word is always truth. It is always life. It provides instruction Lord God, and how we should live the Christian life as you exampled it here on earth. So, Father, we ask right now, Lord God, that you would move mightily in our hearts and our minds, Lord God. Because, Father, we don't want to be the same when we leave as when we came in. We came to have audience with you, Heavenly Father, through the worship, through the preaching of the word, Lord God, to have you speak to us in some way. And so, Father, we pray, Lord God, that you would have your way in our hearts and our minds, even at this very moment. And for everything that is said and done, may you and you alone receive all praise, glory, and honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and everybody said, amen. Before you see, you look at someone and say, lose the critical spirit. I know, right? <laughs> And people say, oh, ouch, that was me. I think it's fair to say that we are living in a very critical time. A time where there seems to be a lot of criticism. From the news to politics, from our schools to the workplace, from our friends to our families, there's a lot of criticisms that we may have of each other. And it seems to be just an abundant, you know, it's, it's like no matter where you go, there'll be someone that can criticize whatever you may say or do. People are very critical of their leaders. And let me just add this. If you ever want to be a leader in anything, no matter what it is, expect criticism to come your way. It's just part of it is the nature of having a leadership position. People will second guess you. But I'm talking about something that is even beyond just being critical here. I'm talking about a critical spirit. And people are critical of Christians. Christians can be critical of each other. If you decide to go right, many will say you should have gone left. It's just so many things that are out there and vice versa. It doesn't matter what's going on. People will look at you and maybe question what you are doing, where you are going, 
how you approach the things of God in your life, for your family, with others, in the church. It doesn't matter. We can be very critical of one another. And in so doing, we can develop a critical spirit. That is not of God. Someone once said, in order to avoid criticism, never do anything. Ever. Yeah, you do that, I guess you can avoid all criticism. But we weren't called to do nothing and just sit here, you know, warm a chair, warm a pew, whatever it may be, go home and just sit on the couch and just watch television. And by the way, we're critical of the things we, should, uh, we watch. We should be, at least. Things that we don't like, we're critical of it. And we see so many things go on and on, and that is fine because there are good and bad criticism. In fact, criticism has two different meanings. Speaking fairly with discernment is good criticism. To speak fairly with discernment, we need to have criticism, productive criticism in our lives, do we not? Because we don't always see clearly. We can be blinded to maybe our own faults, and we need some, someone to come around in a fair manner, in love, to point things out, to help us, because we grow with productive criticism. I'm not talking about that kind of criticism, where someone may come to you in love, put a hand around your shoulder and say, listen, you know what? I'm not against maybe what you said, but maybe how you said it. Maybe you can watch it going forth. And, and there's so many things. And we have to be open to those things, which leads me to the next thing, which is critical thinking. I'm not against that either. Critical thinking at its very core is making judgments with an open and objective view. When you make those judgments, you're open to what's going on, to make a fair view of the facts and the things that are presented before you. What I am speaking against is the, the second part of criticism, which is speaking unfairly with harsh judgments. There's nothing fair about it when you go up to someone and you begin to lambast them. You're definitely not doing it in love. If all you're doing is nitpicking and complaining, that isn't being productive in, in that person's fault. Unfortunately, living in the world that we're living in, it seems to be getting worse. I mean, think about it. If you look, look at the news, the majority of the news are not like good feel stories, you know, like feel good stories. I said that backwards, you know, good feel. Feel good stories, you know. They're, they're, not, they're not like that. It's usually harsh criticism, maybe, of, of whatever going against their viewpoint. It doesn't matter. You look at any news channel, that's what it is. It's like they make money off of being extremely critical of whatever's going on. we got to watch that. With the things that go on in this world, with so much criticism that's going on, we can adopt, we can become just like that, can we not? We can become critical of our brother and sister sitting right on our left and right of us this morning. We become critical of our church. We become critical of so many different things that are out there. And we've got to be careful lest we take on that critical spirit. And the critical spirit, what I'm talking about today, and I want to go through this passage we just read in Mark chapter 3. A critical spirit is an, excessive, is an excessively negative attitude with harshness in judging. And you have to guard against that. You have to guard against it. Proverbs 18.21 says this, the tongue has the power of life and death. Your tongue has the power to sow life in somebody with encouraging words. When someone messes up and they make, you know, they, they sin, they make a mistake, they falter, something may happen, you can bury them with your words make them feel so overly guilty by what they did, keeping them and pressing them down under the thumb, bringing death with your tongue, or you can acknowledge what was going on. Yeah, you shouldn't have done it that way. Yes, that was sin, and you can acknowledge it. That's being fair, right? Acknowledge it. But then also with an encouraging tongue say, you know what? Yet God forgives you. God loves you. God wants to restore you. See the difference. You can bury someone down, whatever it is, and just lambast them, or you can lift them up. You have, according to Proverbs 18.21, the tongue of life or death, and life and death. It's up to you. And then there's a lot of causes for the critical spirit. 
And the very first one, I don't know if you knew this, you know, how does one get that critical spirit? Do you know the number, you know, the number one or the most common cause of a critical spirit is living in a home where the parents have a critical spirit, where they're always criticizing their children. No wonder them, as they get older, they begin to emulate what they have learned in their home. You know, the proverb is just train up a child in the way he should go. You know what? That's good or bad, isn't it? It assumes that we would train up a child in the way they should go as far as in the Lord. That's the assumption. And you, can, you should make that assumption. However, it is universal. Raise up a child in any way, guarantee you, they're going to end up going and emulating whatever it is that you're doing in the home. It's just the way it is. More is, you know, caught than taught, isn't it? Caught by the actions. Well, there's also rejection can cause, uh, you know, the critical spirit. If you feel rejected, become critical, the one that rejected you. But let me tell you something. If you understand your place in God, that you are accepted in God, not rejected, but accepted, it helps you to alleviate that. Having a dark outlook on life. And for the Christian, your outlook should be bright. Yes, I know you may be going through tough times, but you have to understand that God's God, got great plans for you. Amen? Well, that's a little weak. God's got great plans for you. Amen? <laughs> that's it. Because it doesn't matter what you're going now. I know you may be going through some really tough times. But you don't have to allow that to define who you are and define your future. Don't allow that. You know, increase in stress, that's a cause. When stress begins to overwhelm you, where you feel like you can't even breathe, you begin to become negative. Why am I suffering the way I am? What is going on? I mean, maybe I'm just not worthy. Maybe I'm not this. Maybe I'm not that. It begins to have an effect on you. Having a negative mindset, insecurity, all these things go into developing that critical mindset. And I'm telling you all of this because I want you to be aware of these things. I, I, I want you to be able to recognize these things, maybe in your own life. And maybe if someone's doing this to you, you can recognize the spirit. That you don't have to just take it on because so many people listen to the critics. And it's devastating sometimes. And, you know, I'm, I was just reminded of it even last week or the week before. Some of the things that go on, and someone was telling me, you know, Pastor, you know, there's going to be a hundred people that say you're doing a great job, but just one person. And you know that. I know you know that. I know that. Sometimes you need someone to, re, you know, tell us, to remind us because of the one critical thing we seem to focus on the few. Don't take on criticism that's not right or fair, productive criticism. Yes. Could you do things differently? Yes. Could you have, should have done something? Maybe. That was different than you did. Who knows? Only you can answer those questions. But if you give into that stuff, you will begin to change and become critical of others as well. And that's not what God wants with us. The effects of holding on to a critical spirit can be very destructive. Getting to our passage this morning, I want to take a look at some of those effects that we see through the Pharisees and just look at how they treated Jesus. And it doesn't even begin just here in chapter 3. It began in chapter 2 of Mark. Amazingly, that early in the Gospel of Mark, he gets to it right away. It seems like he almost didn't have that year of popularity, just went right to the, the, you know, the, the confrontational year. And the first thing I want to point out to you, that a critical spirit can change your purpose in the Lord. It will have an impact on your mission as a Christian. Like I said, going back to chapter 2, that leads up to this passage here. The Pharisees 
those teachers of the law, those that were looking and being overly critical of Jesus, were doing so over many different things. As we get to this point here, they're extremely mad in chapter 3. And there's a lot of things that led to it. In, verses, in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, they were mad because a man who was paralyzed was dropped down in a mat in the middle of the room and Jesus brought healing by saying he forgave his sins. Who are you to forgive sins? So they're mad at that. Even though the miracle took place, proving who he was. If the miracle didn't come, take place, guarantee you, Jesus would have been stoned right there. But there was a miracle that happened. And so they had to deal with the, the reasoning. They should have had an open mind. You know what? Who in the world would say such a thing and then also have a healing, a bona fide healing? You could put the two and two together, but they didn't. They held on to that critical spirit. In verse 16 of chapter 2, Jesus eats a meal with sinners, tax collectors, and they were mad with, about that as well. Why in the world is he going off with sinners? In verse 18, he refused to honor their rituals. In verse 24, they were upset with him because he, his disciples pick and eat grain on the Sabbath. Jesus refused to play ball by their rules, and they despised him for it. They were adding laws upon laws to things, especially when it came to the Sabbath. In Mark 2.27, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Interesting. Because the Pharisees... And they're being overly critical, having that critical spirit, not listening to anything that Jesus would say, missed that very point. Jesus points it out. Listen, do you know that you weren't, you know, God didn't just create the Sabbath and then you to worship the Sabbath, to live for the Sabbath. Because if that were the case, then they would be bound by the laws of the Sabbath. Their purpose would be fulfilling the Sabbath, and that's not what it was. See how it would change it. Having a proper view, letting go of the critical spirit, they can actually embrace it and sit there and say, hey, listen, let's change all these rules. See, the Pharisees put rules upon rules. I talked to you about this before. I'm not getting into it again. Needless to say, I do want to say this one thing. Interesting, though, as they go through it, and they're making up all these rules to keep the Sabbath so people wouldn't break the Sabbath. They added rule upon rule upon rule. It's very interesting to me. In one of the readings, I don't know if it was in the Mishnah or, or the Talmud, but in one of them, they actually had went into length. Lengthy stay in just looking at it and looking at an egg and debating the egg. If an egg by a chicken is laid on the Sabbath, are we allowed to eat it? They went to lengthy discussions just deciding whether or not it's, it's lawful or not to eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath. Do you see what happens? They begin to worship the Sabbath rather than the Lord of the Sabbath. And bringing me to that point, Jesus says in 227, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In verse 28 in Mark 2, Jesus continues and says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Case in point. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Instead of worshiping the Sabbath, they should have been worshiping him. They should acknowledge who was just there among them. In Mark 3, 4, getting back to our passage, then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Amazingly, people had all kinds of opinions these are teachers of the law. These, well, by the way, if you, if you know what a teacher of the law is, because you had your fa Pharisees, your Sadducees, you have your teachers of the law. Teachers of the law could be a Pharisee or a Sadducee. They're on both sides. They're called the scribes. The scribes were the lawyers. Usually, if you see them together, because there was a legal dispute that was going on. I'll get to that a little bit later. They wanted to legally take a look at what Jesus was doing, so they're observing it. That's why the teachers of the law, the scribes, those who write everything, had memorized. They, they know the law. They're the lawyers of the day. 
And so the Pharisees show up with their lawyers, basically. Is what he's saying accurate? Is what he's saying good? With all these opinions going on, they're not short of saying something. When Jesus asked them a simple question, they remained silent. They couldn't answer it because a critical spirit wouldn't allow them to answer it. It was a rhetorical question. Of course, you're going to save a life rather than kill it. But you, should you do it on the Sabbath? Well, if you're having a whole lot of debate on whether or not you should eat an egg that's laid on the Sabbath, you may have a hard time distinguishing between life and death should you support one or the other on the Sabbath. And this is what Jesus was going to A critical spirit refuses to look and even have common sense. You know what? I think we should save that person's life. No, it's a Sabbath. Let him die. Really? That's a discussion? But they remained silent. They couldn't even answer that. And if you have a critical spirit, do you know that you can have that same kind of a spirit towards your neighbor? Your neighbor could have a lot of needs. But you may think, well, you know what? Today is not the good day. I'm too busy. Or maybe they don't deserve my help. Maybe they've been playing their radio too loud. I've been asking them to keep it down, and they won't do it. They're ignoring me, so I'm going to ignore them. Die in the driveway. I'm not coming out to help you. That's a critical spirit, and that's not of God. We have never been called to just allow someone to die when it is within our power to give life. How much more so to give life with the gospel of Jesus Christ rather than to withhold it? Nah, 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 nah. That person's too evil. They deserve hell. They're not going to hear the gospel from me. What kind of a spirit is that? And I've heard that spirit. Not always named like that. Not always explained like that. They can't get over their own emotions. I just can't do it, Pastor. You don't understand what they've done. Yeah, you need to get over it. And you need to help. But we can have the same critical spirit of our church. We can have our own critical spirit of people we don't even know. We can judge people just by the clothes that they're wearing. We've got to watch it. Holding on to a critical spirit, like I said, changes your purpose. And it does so from within. Jesus may have a, a, a beautiful purpose and a mission for you in this world. But if you hold on a critical spirit, you begin to sour your spirit. Your spirit sours. I, I, follow my train of thought in this. If we know and if we acknowledge that the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we acknowledge that fruit of the Spirit, and if we hold on to a critical spirit, our spirit becomes... What happens to fruit as it sours? As it spoils? All that fruit that you may have been working on, the love, the joy, it sours. You lose the love. You lose the joy of your salvation. You lose all that because, see, you'd rather hold on to a critical spirit. And it's not the Holy Spirit's fault. The Holy Spirit's trying to work with you. But if you don't want to listen to the Holy Spirit, if you don't want to submit to the ways of the Holy Spirit, then your spirit begins to sour because you're just overly critical. And that's right. What happens when it sours? Well, then hatred takes the place of love, discord, division, takes the place of unity and peace. Jealousy replaces joy. Fits of rage takes the place of peace. This is what happens to hold on to a critical spirit. And you see all of this play out in the passage that we looked at this morning. Second, the critical spirit can cause us to be distracted from the things of God. Critical spirit misses what God is doing in the moment, always. Always, because you're too busy trying to validate if this is God or not. And I'm not talking about, hey, listen, if someone says something a little wonky, that you should say, whoa. But to sit there and just always be critical of somebody, never giving them any room to move, either in the spirit or otherwise, that's not of God. And you will miss a move of God in that person's life because you're, so, you're being so critical of them. You'll miss what's going on in a service. Very interesting 
You know, going to the synagogue on the Sabbath was a common practice. In ancient times as it is today, you should go to it. And we would say church today. And you go there to worship God, not to be critical of your fellow believers or to be critical of your church. Because if, I tell you what, if you are critical of people, you will not like people. If you're critical of your church, you'll end up leaving your church. Rather than being part of a solution and working toward the impact, if you're critical of your community, critical of your state, critical of your government, you're going to leave the country, leave the state, leave your place you may be, and you're going to start meandering and going wherever you want to go rather than what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. I've seen it happen time and time again. I've seen it happen time and time again, and all it is is a souring of the Spirit. And people begin to think that it's the Holy Spirit. No, it isn't. It's because you can't get over that critical spirit that begins to sour and change. Like I said, if the Holy Spirit within you produces a fruit, what happens if the fruit sours? We're going to the synagogue, you know, we're talking about being distracted. Should be for, about worshiping God, not being critical of others. Being in the synagogue that morning with that man with the crippled hand was an incredible blessing, wasn't it? If he didn't go to church, he would have missed out on that blessing. If he, you know, if he hadn't gone to the synagogue. Say, I already moved him all the way in the first century. Here's the difference. That man probably came time and time and time again. How many times had he gone to the synagogue and never healed? The difference was when Jesus showed up. And yes, it was a Sabbath. And Jesus, looking to do good, having compassion on this man, tells him to stand up and everyone. He didn't hide. Isn't it interesting? Jesus doesn't hide anything. Right in front of plain view of everyone. Now, in chapter 2, he already knows what they're thinking. He didn't need the Holy Spirit in his life to tell him what they were thinking. He already knew going in that they were going in. He says, stand up in front of everyone. everyone. Everyone who was thinking negative and everything else. Knowing the thoughts, he brings healing. He would have missed out on that blessing had he had the same kind of a attitude as a Pharisee. I'm not going to go to church today. I'm going to put a big plug in that we miss out on many blessings when we decide not to go to church, when we decide not to be a part of a congregation and just to hold to ourselves. But what I want you to find is, is this. Isn't it interesting, don't you find it interesting that the man with the shriveled hand and the Pharisees got exactly what they wanted out of the service? They, the man with the shriveled hand got a healing. The Pharisees got criticism. They were looking for it and achieved their goals. What does it say about our attitudes when we come to church? What does it say about our attitudes when we go to school, when we go to the workplace? Our attitudes of wanting to do something for God rather than having a critical spirit about our boss. Yes, our boss may have done something incredibly wrong. Well, we confront it. We do it the right way. But don't hold on to that bitterness. Let it go or it will change you. No one is worth having things changed. You know, don't allow yourself to be changed into something that God didn't want you to be. Three, a critical spirit causes us to focus on the faults of others rather than ever acknowledging any good. Do you know, if you have a critical spirit of someone, I don't care what they do, you can, will just hold on to just that critical, yeah, I know they did this, but what they did to me, you don't even acknowledge anything. You hold on to that. In Matthew 7, 3, it says this, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Remember what we talked about. They were looking at Jesus and looking for a reason to accuse him. When someone is looking to accuse you, it doesn't matter what you say. They're going to try to twist it to be something that you never intended. Case in point, take a look at Jesus at his trial on the night that he was betrayed. They brought up all kinds of things, but they were twisting his words, trying to get a, some kind of a conviction, something that would stick so they could put him on the cross. That's what they wanted. And so it didn't matter why, what Jesus would say. So what did he do? He just remained silent. 
A sheep before its shears is silent. As they were trying to fleece him, what was he going to say? They would twist it no matter what. When he told the truth, he actually gave them by telling the truth. Because they couldn't come up with their own. So you know what, guys? It's taking a long time to come up with that decision. So let me help you with it. And he tells them exactly who he is. Blasphemy, they tear the robe. Up until then, they didn't know what to do with them because nothing was happening. But they were watching him closely. When you have a critical mind, you begin to watch people closely. You begin to nitpick. You begin to pick apart a message Well, I wouldn't have used that word, pastor. I would use a different word. It's more descriptive. You know what? I'm not an English major. Never was. Terrible at English. So, (laughs) you could pick everything apart if you want. You could pick anything you want. Stare at it long enough with a critical spirit. You'll find the faults of everything and of everyone. But while you're doing that, are you going to be as equally critical of yourself. See, that's the problem with people with a critical spirit. We live in a day and age, even the news media, if they're critical of someone, they never say that, well, yeah, we can acknowledge this. No, nothing's ever acknowledged. It's just critical, 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 critical. Doesn't matter who you listen to. Because we can't dare be fair. Because I may give some credence or whatever. And so we just tear apart and tear down one another. We have to be careful of that. Throughout the Bible, the Pharisees followed Jesus wherever he went, and they scrutinized everything, looking to trap him. In Jeremiah 20, verse 10, I love how Jeremiah puts this. All my friends are waiting for me to slip. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but man, I tell you, if you've ever been there where someone's just trying to be critical, it doesn't matter what you say, they're going to have something about it. They're going to write a review. They're going to get, you know, whatever it may be. And they're going to just tear you down. And it doesn't really matter because they're not walking in your shoes. As long as you can sit there and say, I am doing what I feel is right in God's eyes. I am trying to do the best according to the Holy Spirit and the leading and guiding of thereof. I mean, I'll tell you, why are you listening to the critics? Don't listen to them because they're waiting for you to slip up and to pounce. Four, the critical spirit causes us to make hasty judgment of others. Again, Scripture says that some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. According to West, the word translated accused means to accuse formally before a tribune. So they wanted to put Jesus on trial so they could condemn him. That's what they wanted. In fact, it ends with, our passage this morning ended with, when they left, they wanted to figure out a way to kill him. That's what they wanted to do. But everything he did, he backed up with a miracle. How do you do that? Right? He heals a paralytic. He heals a man with a shriveled hand in the middle of there. I mean, he's too popular with the people. He's proving that it's okay to do it with miracles. It was like They didn't look at any compassion for the people that Jesus was healing or touching or blessing. They didn't care. John 7.24 says this, Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. If you have a critical spirit, you've already already passed judgment on the person. Be careful. And I love Romans 14.4. I live by this. Mostly for myself, I will say that. But I also remind you if any time I talk to someone else. But remind, remember this. When someone's overly critical of you, remember this verse, Romans 14, 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. That has got me through so much of the criticisms. Even the criticisms that were, you know, that were fair. That just, I had to learn, I had to grow through these things because of my blindness or whatever. And even in those moments, I I go back to this. As long as a person's fair, I accept it and I I receive it and I'll work on it. I always go back to this and even though I fell, I'll be able to stand. Even though I may have not done and and honored Christ in everything, in my attitude or whatever else, I'll stand because God is able to make me stand. 
He's able to make you stand no matter what. So it doesn't matter the criticism that comes your way. Remember this verse. And remember as well, who are they to judge you? To your own master, you stand or fall. To your own master is God alone. And most people haven't talked to you, know you enough to even make a fair judgment. Because they don't know the heart. They don't know what was going on here. That's why Jesus said, stop, make, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Five, the critical spirit can cause irrational thought, <laughs> being overly emotional. It will do that. When someone's being overly critical, it's amazing how, the, uh, you know, it, it, how emotion is just under, underlining everything. Even if they are maybe rational, uh, you know, out front and they're talking rational, underneath they're just seething. Because that doesn't even make sense. It's like, why are you continuing to press this issue? In Luke's account of this passage, Luke actually has his own version of this. Same, uh, same situations going on. He reveals the emotional state of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And, here, and that's what he says there. Um, and in Luke's account, he actually says the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Well, Mark only says there was many that had the problem. Luke points them out. It was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It was the scribes. It was the lawyers of the day that were there. And in Luke 6, 11, he says this, but they were filled with rage. Here's the emotion behind it. And discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, in Mark's account, they were going to kill Jesus. In Luke's account, they were, they were discussing what they're going to do to do about Jesus or do to Jesus. But I want to draw your, uh, your eye to the word rage, the emotion here that's back behind them. They were filled with rage. Don't answer his questions. Don't do anything. Just kind of rage about him. Because at every step of the way, they didn't make any sense and Jesus did. Jesus had common sense. He was bringing the heart of the law back to the people. He was restoring things that had been, become nothing but legalism. A justice without heart. And it wasn't reflective of God. And as Jesus was trying to instruct them and, and, and ta teach them, they could at least listen to it. No, they were ignoring the miracles, ignoring Jesus, and they were just being filled with rage because they were so stubborn. Rage here is also madness. <laughs> Have you ever seen anyone in a wild rage? It's like they're mad, isn't it? They're just throwing things, doing things. Maybe even killing people in a violent rage. It also means a lack of understanding. So while they are in this rage, I wonder how open and objective they were when they discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. When it comes to a critical spirit, you need to be a blessing in someone's life, not a curse. You're not called, no matter what happens to you, you're not called to curse people. You are called to be a blessing to people. You are called to emulate Jesus, who by dying on the cross became a curse, to bring death to the curse, to end it, to bring life, and if we're supposed to be like Christ, that's what leads Paul to say in 1 Corinthians, why not rather be wronged rather than have lawsuits against one another? A critical spirit will bring up the lawsuit because they have to work within that. And they miss out on the mercy and grace that the Lord has to offer. There's a stubbornness that comes about it that just can't let it be. In Mark 3, 6, it says, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Interesting, isn't it? It doesn't matter about the miracles. And they do this time and time again. They refused to let it go. They became overly critical. No matter where he went, traps were set up. Hey, Jesus, 
Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? One trick question after another, and Jesus handled it so much so that even that particular day that I'm talking about, they walked away frustrated because he answered every question well, perfectly. See, because Jesus didn't answer the question, and you have to learn this. It took me many years to learn in ministry. It's easy to respond to to legalism or to the letter of the law with the letter of the law. What do I mean by that? Someone comes to you and quotes you scripture. It's easy to respond with another scripture, negating that. What you're doing is having a legal battle with the word of God. You're using one verse to counter another verse, and that's not necessarily wrong. I'm talking about the critical spirit here. I mean, yes, is what we do, right? We, we need to be students of the Word. So I'm not talking about the good way of using it. What I am saying is, and that stubbornness, the stiff neck, the people trying to trip someone up, Jesus instead, instead of just confronting it, using their tactics, he did not answer the letter of the law, but he brought them something that they did not have, and that was the heart of the law. Case in point, when he says, bring me a denarius, so who should we pay taxes to? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? He says, bring me a denarius. Whose inscription is on it? Caesar's. Then he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God, God's. Interesting, if you know anything about the culture there, the people, they didn't, they didn't miss this. To give a temple coin. Remember the money changers in the temple where Jesus would overturn the tables? Do you know those coins? The reason why they have a changing of coins? Because you couldn't use a coin that was minted by the Roman government because it had the inscription of Caesar on it. To do so would be blasphemy. It would be sacrilege because you can't offer anything with a graven image. So the money changers were in the temple to do one thing, to take your coins of Caesar and to give you Plain coins, nothing on them that you can now take and enter into the temple and give that. Jesus was saying, give to God the plain coins. You know what they are? Give to God what is his. And if this is Caesar's inscription, give it to him. In doing so, he addressed the heart of their issue, not only the law. He always fulfilled the law which is what he came to do, right? He says, not a jot or tittle of the law will be dismissed. (laughs) But he came to fulfill it. He came to bring the heart of it. At that particular time, it was so critical. The Pharisees were so critical of the people. They had lost the heart of serving the people. They were lording it over so much so that Jesus says, you lay on all this load, the law upon law upon law of the people. You lay on such a heavy load and you don't even offer a finger to lift it up. Let us not be in this time and age because it's so easy to become critical like the world is critical. There's so many things that are going on in our nation right now. Be careful to have and take on a critical spirit of one another, of our God, of churches, of our government, and everything else. Do it in a right and fair way, always. Always. Yes, backed by the Word of God. This is, everything is our litmus test, right? But nothing should ever be done without the heart of the Word. Because to do so, you'll make the same mistake as the Pharisees (laughs) and the lawyers of the day, the scribes. As the worship team comes, I brought this message out because I felt this is what God wanted. We need to be careful. I am not saying that we should not be fair in our criticism of one another. We should because we grow from fair criticism, constructive criticism. We grow with that, and that's fair game because without that, We can't even plot a proper course. In fact, if you think about it, everything in the Bible is constructive criticism, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, it it, it shows us the way we're going, and if it's not correct, we need to make change the course. It's what it's here for, to help us. 
And so from godly people, we should accept that fair criticism. But from people that just want to do you harm, don't do it. And more importantly, have we fallen under that pill of critical, just, just a critical inspection of one another, that critical spirit. I call it a spirit because it's something when you've done it time and time again, it just changes you. And it's like we're always looking for the next person to slip up or make a mistake. <laughs> Don't be that person. It's hard to lead someone to the Lord being that kind of a person. Let's reach our community. Let's reach one another. Let's be there for one another. Not with harsh judgment. We don't have the right to just sit there and judge people. We can offer advice if they ask it. Because usually if they don't ask it, it's not received. So why give it? If you're going to be constructive, do so always in love. Because you, if you do it in love, then you want that person's well-being. You have it out for them. You, 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 you have their intentions. That You have their heart. You want to do it for them and not just for yourself. Let's strive to be the church that God wants us to be. Amen? I'm going to leave these altars open. And I don't know if you are struggling with a critical spirit. I don't know if you have been struggling with people being overly critical of you and maybe you feel that weight of that criticism. Like I said, this message goes both ways, which is why I spoke it. I, I, I don't want you to be under the thumb of unjust criticism. Recognize it and overcome it. At the same time, if we are being overly critical of someone else, whatever it might be, we've got to recognize that in ourselves. Change course now. Why sour our own spirits? Let's seek God this morning, church. Let him have his way in our lives. God loves you. He's got a great plan for you. He's got a great plan for this church. He's got a great plan for your children. Let us, let him do it what he needs. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much for what you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord God, that Father, you have come to bring salvation to this world. And sometimes that salvation, and always actually, requires us to admit that we are sinners. To admit that we have done things that we may even be ashamed of. But that's the only way that we can grow. It's the only way that we can receive your mercy and grace. Is by coming before you repenting of our sins accepting Jesus Christ making the proclamation of faith our faith in you and we ask right now Heavenly Father that you would minister to each and every person those who may be feeling the weight of unjust criticism Lord God I pray that you would free them from that that you would set them free, Lord God, that when they leave here, they will be able to breathe easy, Lord God. Because, Lord God, sometimes our own minds can be so cruel to us, Lord God, that we get to question so many different things and question even our own position in you, Lord God. Father, that is not of you. Lord God, we want to be free. Free from the unjust criticism, Lord God. The unfair criticism. The harsh criticism that has nothing to do but lead to death and not bring life. But Father, I know that you bring life, and I just speak it now into each and every person's life here, Lord God. I just speak life, health, healing in Jesus' name. Those within the sound of my voice, accept that, receive it. And if we have been critical of others, overly critical that we seem to be critical of everything lately maybe we can't find any good in anyone we can't own up to it we know that our very our deeds our good deeds are like filthy rags to not even acknowledge when someone does something that may be decent so critical to 
turn people away. We don't want that in our lives, Lord God. We don't want to be filled with the spirit of the world. We want to be filled with the spirit. <laughs> with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So Father, I pray, Lord God, as we give that over to you today, we ask, Lord God, that you would have your way in our lives. We turn our lives over to you, and if there is any critical spirit, we ask forgiveness now. We don't want that. We want to emulate Jesus Christ, who did not accept the sin, but was willing to give tax collectors the worst of sinners, mercy and grace. Father, may we be a church like that. May we be a people like that. And if you're here today, I'm going to leave these altars open. Maybe you have need of specific prayer. Whatever it may be. It could be healing. It may be on point of this subject here. Maybe you just want to come here and give something to the Lord right now. Maybe something in your life that you've been harboring, saying, listen, this is the day I'm giving it over to God, and I don't want it anymore in my life. Whatever it might be, let's do business with God. It's so easy just to get up and not do that and just walk out. I know we're all hungry. Lunch is around the corner. My stomach begins to remind me every time on Sunday. But some things are more important making sure that before we leave here, that we're doing the right thing before God, and that's the most important thing. So do business with God this morning. Allow Him to work His mercy and grace in your life. These altars are open if you want someone to pray with you, or if you just want to come and kneel before the altar and come before God. Whatever it is, these altars are open as the worship team leads us. Just come. See you.